uh, share my screen again and welcome our next two uh, presenters and our closing plenary. I'm very pleased to introduce Mareneke Giwa Onewu, a global advocate, educator, and autistic person of color in a neurodiverse, multicultural, serodifferent family. A prolific writer, consultant, and social scientist and activist whose work focuses on meaningful community involvement, human rights, intersectional justice, and inclusion. Moran Gay is a humanities scholar at Rice University Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, is co-chair of the Women's HIV Research Collaborative, a doctoral candidate, and a member of several executive boards. She has been an invited speaker at the United Nations, the White House, and numerous peer-reviewed international conferences, and has led and or contributed to many initiatives and publications. Current and, research, current and recent projects include the 2021 edited collection, Sincerely, Your Autistic Child, What People on the Autism Spectrum Wish Their Parents Knew About Growing Up, Acceptance and Identity, and the forthcoming Neurodiversity and War, a collection of Black neurodiverse voices. Serving as a respondent in this, in this presentation will be Dina Gassner, a PhD candidate at Adelphi University and serving as an inaugural member of the International Society for Autism Research, INSAR's Autistic Researcher Committee, and has published many book chapters and journal articles in her career. In close partnership, she developed and honed leadership skills first with the regional leadership and later with testimonies to the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, or IAC, the Government Accountability Office, the Department of Defense, and in 1999 was awarded the Kathy Pratt Professional of the Year Award from the Autism Society of America. Since coming to the ARC Board of Directors, she served on the Policy Committee for six years and as the Chair of the National Council on Self-Advocates for four years. Her contributions to ARC's policies included the inclusion of LGBTQAI intersectionality and maternal wellness for mothers of IDD. She was appointed to the IAC's Mental Health Subcommittee of the Healthcare Disparities Workgroup and presented a Women's Voice, Understanding Autistic Needs, for the National Institute of Mental Health Office of Autism Research Coordination. Her international advocacy has included multiple presentations around the world and specifically three statements at the United Nations in New York and one in Geneva. Her most recent UN invocation came from the countries of Malta and Australia and focused on autistic motherhood. I am perfectly thrilled to introduce and bring both of these incredible speakers to you. I turn it over. Thank you, Dawn. I was like, why won't it let me unmute myself? <laughs> um, thank you for that, um, that introduction of Dina and myself, and thank you all for being here and what I know has been somewhat of a long day for you um, today for um, the ARP Research Day. I'm Marenike Giwa Onaiwu. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. And I'm going to be giving um, a, a closing keynote to you all on research and treatment activism. And then um, Dina will be um, sharing some responses and some closing thoughts. Um, I, this is my first time to um, the ARP um, AUCD Research Day um, as the keynote, as your keynote closer, and probably my last. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, giving a disclaimer. If anything I say today resonates with you and is really, you know, and is amazing, then um, please check out the Autistic Research <laughs> Review Board um, of the ARP. Um, but if what I say, it, you know, does not resonate with you and is horrible, then please, <laughs> please um, consider that to be my um, individual perspective. Uh, although I am a member of the A. RRB, um, I am speaking for myself. Um, my colleagues may or may not, you know, endorse the things that I share. Um, next slide, please. So this is a research day and we've had 
many different rapid fire presentations and kind of Q&A and different things about the different nodes of ARP um, and just, you know, kind of some of the different opportunities and, you know, the situations that are facing a, a number of people on the spectrum. And um, if you, those of you who are involved in AUCD, you, this is already your wheelhouse, so to speak. You're already involved in neurodevelopmental disabilities. You're already involved in um, multidisciplinary work. Um, chances are you went into research not because of the paycheck, <laughs> um, because there's other things that you could be doing in the industry that would compensate you better. Um, you're here because you're a person that's curious. You're here because you want to make a difference. You're here because you know that research is the foundational work that translates later into practice. And so you're, you know, a forerunner and, you know, you've worked hard for, you know, the role that you are in now. And again, and we understand research is broad. So um, all human beings are learning in the school of life. So um, whether you're an ally, a parent, you could be, you know, you lived expertise or research might be your laboratory. Whereas for some of you, it is your profession. Um, but at any rate, there's a role involved for all of us. But we, we can, I think we can agree that it's, it's of, of major importance that it's something that's really revolutionized um, the way that we, our policy, our education, our practice, um, you know, technology and so forth. Next slide, please. And so all of these things, your involvement, your presence here today, um, the things that you do, all of these things together kind of make up who you are. It's the years of schooling that you put in. Um, it's the years, um, you know, of life that you've lived. It's those late hours on Google. It's whatever, it's the blood, sweat, and tears. Again, this could be, a, you know, I believe that this is a mixed group of individuals. So we've got everyone here from researchers to um, parents, to self-advocates, to um, students, to, you know, um, investigators, practitioners. It's a, a broad range of individuals. I don't know your story, but I know that there's, you know, that you've put some skin in the game, you know, to be here. And I know that, you know, that you know that there are <laughs> tons of inequities that exist within the uh, developmental disability population, you know, co community and the autistic um, community specifically, um, as that's what we're talking about right now. Next slide, please. And I know that, you know, this isn't easy. I know that there are days that this work is frustrating. I know that there isn't sufficient funding for the things that you need to do. I know that there isn't, there aren't enough answers. There aren't enough, there isn't enough time. I know, um, I know that when I think about all of the different hats that I wear, you know, as a student, as a social scientist researcher, as an advocate, as a, a person, an adult with an autism diagnosis, as a parent of autistic children and other um, children with disabilities, as a member of, of the community, of, as a person of color, as a non-binary woman, all of these things, I can think about all of the different times that, you know, it's been, it, it, it can weigh on you. It's meaningful and important work but it, it does have a cost. It has an emotional cost. It has an intellectual cost. It has a time cost, not just for me, but for all of us, for everyone involved. Um, and um, um, as we learn our mistakes um, and our successes, you know, those are, you know, those costs are attributed to the generation that comes behind us. So everything that we do, there is a ripple effect. Next slide, please. And I'm saying that because of the fact that the, the farther along that you get and the more connections that you make, people, um, it, it becomes very interesting, like the more things that you, you're still you, but the more things that you've learned or done or accomplished, um, people kind of get farther and farther away from that activist part of you. Um, and they want to focus on the fact that you're a researcher, you're serious, you're not just, you're not out there just like Black Lives Matter, and not that, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you, there's this differentiation that people start to make at a certain point. Um, I think for me, it started in graduate school, then it was all of a sudden, oh, you know, I was the same exact person, but, you know, have you achieved some little level of knowledge here, and then you've done this, and you've done that, and it starts to shift over time, depending as your titles, you know, um, change. And it's very interesting because I think about um, how Bishop Desmond Tutu's um, saying, you know, the slogan about um, that in situations of injustice, there's no such thing as neutrality. If a, um, an elephant has his foot on the tail of a mouse, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. There are some situations that don't allow for us to, um, to be neutral. Um, and I think that people, you know, 
those of us who care about research, you think of research as something that's objective, something that's, you know, science, that's evidence-based, something that's looking at, you know, concrete things and so forth and, you know, isn't, you know, steeped in, you know, um, in, in subjectivity or superstition, but it's still something that people <laughs> are involved in. And so I think that we can't get away from that, that aspect and we have to understand, next slide, please. that as beautiful as the um, Swiss Alps are, there is no Switzerland when it comes to autism research. Um, I have to tell you, um, you, you might sometimes, I think people wonder, am I an advocate, an activist? Am I a, am I a parent? Am I a researcher? What am I? You're all of those things. You can't afford not to have, be an activist. You can't afford not to be involved. You can't afford not to care. We aren't in a position <laughs> You know, and we don't have the luxury given the, you know, the number of um, suboptimal outcomes and, and challenges that are facing our community from our youth to our adults to be that. There is no Switzerland for you. It simply does not exist. Next slide, please. Because the fact of the matter is we are existing in a situation now in practice, in research, in education, in any field, in any, any of these areas with regard to autism, there is huge inequity, you know, not just inequality, there's also inequity. And it's built into the system and it's pervasive. And um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Just today, um, so I, I am on, there are listservs that I'm sure most of us are part of. Um, just today, I received an email and it was a typical type of email that I get all the time that they want you to forward to all of your networks. Um, it was, you know, a group that's doing a research study that has gotten a five-year grant, um, you know, of nearly seven figures, um, and they are having difficulty finding autistic adults, particularly those of color and, and non-speaking, to share their experiences of dealing with death and grief and trauma, and they really want everyone to push and push to their networks and get people to do this, and for sharing this, you would get a $25 gift card. And they made a big point of saying that this was not included in the original grant, but that these, this organization was adding this money on its own. And I started to look and I started to count the number of consultants. And I started to count the number of, of this and that in the grant. And I, I eventually just stopped counting. Um, I, uh, I also started researched some of the people involved. I found one autistic person, but, I, but this isn't atypical. This is the norm. This is, off, and actually, this might be generous because typically you're being asked to share for free. Um, and I don't mean just for free in terms of no financial compensation. I mean no, um, no sense of, um, of true regard or respect for what um, people are, you know, what, for people's lived expertise and for what they bring to the table and for things that differ from what, you know, might be the status quo or might be what is um, considered appropriate by non-autistic people in charge, because that's who's in charge, that's who the majority is. There is an article, if you have not read it, I encourage you to read it. It's by a, an autistic researcher, Monique Botha, um, and it was published last month. And it talks a lot about the toll that it takes um, and the, the experiences of, of the, the life of being an autistic researcher. And you don't have to be a researcher to understand the poignant things that she's sharing in this article, um, because you simply just have to kind of look around at the world that we live in. Um, I want you to think about the IRBs that you, you know you have sent studies to, or I want you to think about the research teams that you're involved with, or I want you to think about the um, the special education teams, the, diag the diagnosticians, or I want you to think about the developmental um, physicians. I want you to think about the neurologists. I want you to think about all of this. How many autistic people are are in any of are among any of those? I won't even say autistic people of color or queer autistic people. I'll just say autistic at all. Typically, very few. How many autistic people are involved in the leadership of autism organizations? Not some kind of peripheral um, sub-advisory group that meets once every three years so that, you know, or, or has a, a cute spot at a, at a lunch plenary when no one is listening, you know, or gets their name at the bottom in size four font at the bottom of a very long, you know, um, abstract. I mean, meaningfully fully involved. Um, and when there, and we all know that there are barriers in terms of, you know, educational attainment and other things, but we've talked a lot about trying to understand working through different challenges, you know, for, to be able to 
you know, address communication differences or so forth. Are you, are there people involved at a level, you know, of, at a, a level of authority um, to where they have meaningful, um, you know, leadership from the beginning to the end, not just a focus group that you just put together and then you went on your way, not the same list, the same people in your, you know, your listserv that you reach out to when you need a few autistic voices or you need a letter of support, not the, um, not our parents, even though I am a parent myself, um, I, my children, I, I do love and, and know a lot about them, but they, ultimately their lives are their lives. And there's only so much of a perspective I can give of their life. I can give the like, you know, as their mother, I can share what it's like to be their mother, but I'm not, I'm only a portion. I'm, I amplify the voice that they have, even if their voice is not clearly heard. Um, and so I want to think about the fact that um, what language are you using when you submit manuscripts and abstracts? Are you, have you, are you using stigmatizing terms? Are you using functioning labels, low functioning, high functioning, severe, mild? Are you including people who have, um, you know, both, you know, cognitive disabilities and autism or, and other, you know, and substance use? Are you getting data sets that look like the community, that look like my children and myself? Or is it, are you doing what's easy? You know, because doing what's right isn't easy, you know, and I know that I'm, I'm, this is the end of the, the, um, this long day and that closing keynotes are supposed to ramp you up. Um, but I'm really just wanting to really make you think, to make all of us think um, about how we can do better, who's not in the room, who's not at the table, because as they say, if you're not on, on the table, you're on the menu, at the table, you're on the menu. And, you know, as Shirley Chisholm says, if there's no seat for you, at the table, then you bring a folding chair. Um, this, you know, ultimately all of this belongs to the community. It is, it is a shared endeavor. And so it, tokenistic involvement isn't acceptable. And so your role, whatever it is, is there a way to more, to be creative and devote the funds and the extra time and the extra, the energy, whatever it's going to take to be sure that you truly infuse the study with the thoughts and the perspectives of the community, even if you don't like what the community sometimes has to say, because it's going to make your work richer. Next, next slide, please. I want to challenge you because when people think about activism, again, this is what they think about. Um, protests, die-ins, and those are all important ways to be an activist. There's so many ways to advocate and be an activist, so many ways. But I, I want to talk about some of the activists that have um, nurtured me in my life who, who I, I look up to when they talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. And then I, I'll close because I'd like Dina to have some time to share and then anyone else. Um, so as a several different family, um, we've done a you know, number of you know, pediatric and, you know, and other um, HIV research work. And um, I think about the people who were, you know, who were, were shunned by some of their medical colleagues because they were working with those, those AIDS patients you know, or because they were, um, you know, wouldn't suit up in, in hazmat gear, you know, um, you know, and, and things of that nature. Um, when they were trying to, you know, or people who, who spoke up about things that they thought were, were not right, or they wanted, or they demanded more funding, or they asked for uh, a paid role for a community liaison on their team, or they, um, you know, wanted to make sure that they co-authored with community individuals, or that they used the terminology that people preferred, people living with HIV as opposed to HIV infected individuals and so on, and that they amplified the voices of the, of the people. I want, to think of, I want you to think about the fact that the largest and oldest HIV clinical research network in the world, the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, every single research um, site is required to have an autonomous functioning um, community advisory board and outside of that board to have a network, a community person at the network level. So everywhere that, you know, so where, if the PI is going on a scientific retreat, if they're going to um, present at this international conference, if they're going whatever, if they're called, the community person goes to. <laughs> their community person at each individual site has a role. They have a voting role on, the, on, the, on every single protocol team, on every single committee, and they learn and they be able, they're able to give their, their, their share, their expertise. No, they're not a statistician. No, they're not a virologist. There are certain things that are not their, their forte, but they're involved and they're at the table from the beginning. Sites that do not, um, you know, adhere to this and do not have um, 
true community involvement because the community person also is part of the quality assurance and the evaluation the performance evaluation metrics at the end of the year every year and they fill out some documents independently sites will literally lose their funding that's how important it is you you don't have the community buy-in you don't have your you don't have your community part intact you don't have a site and um, I know that might sound drastic but I just think about the fact that the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine that many of you have you know, going through, you know, running through your veins right now was developed on the, you know, on the research of these same in a, a HIV clinical trials networks, the monoclonal antibodies research they've been doing for over 10 years. A lot of the practices that we have today with regard to, you know, informed consent and so many other things um, and, you know, engagement and participation come from these luminaries. And it didn't start out like, you know, uh, it, it didn't start out all kumbaya. It started out just like this, where activists, regular everyday people had to die in the, do die-ins in the street and bum rush and lock themselves to doors because no one wanted to hear what they had to say. But eventually when people got over themselves and then they started listening to each other, the researchers and the community, they realized that that learned expertise and that lived expertise together are so golden that you need both. You can't just have your lived expertise. It's great, but it's not enough. You can't just have that those all those degrees and that learned expertise. It's great. It's not enough. You must have both. And that's why you need to be both until, until there's enough of us, until our voices can be amplified, until there's enough of us that are able to be somewhere to share our perspectives. We need you to do that for us. Next slide, please. We're one world. We're one community. You know, one of the things that's very, you know, beautiful and, um, you know, and I think very um, revolutionary actually about this air, air, um, this itineration of the ARP is its strong stance on neurodiversity, you know, and, um, and so there's many things, but that's one in particular. And so again, if you think about the concept of neurodiversity, it is that that mirrors that of biodiversity is that having this, you know, heterogeneity and uniqueness amongst living things allows us to thrive and grow, allows us to fight off disease, allows us to um, evolve. And we, the same exists in neurodiversity. For not even two non-autistic or two neurotypical people are alike. Even identical twins have different brains. We need the different roles. We need the different visions. We need the different um, energy and time. But we need you to, to, to show up. You know, so you can't just have your research hat on. You can't just have your mom hat on. You can't just have your two student hat on. You need to be an activist because we're being shocked, but legally shocked, and we're being, um, you know, murdered, and we're being um, disenfranchised, and we're losing jobs, and we're committing suicide, and we're, you know, drowning, wandering, and drowning, and we are being sexually abused, and all of these things, and these numbers aren't going to decrease unless you make them. The last next two slides are just my contact information. Um, my website is morenakgo.com and this is my um, part-time assistant as, as a disabled adult. I can't keep up with anything. <laughs> I need help and accommodation. So um, and this is on social media. I'm at morenakgo. So it's like more Nike and go, like go away. Um, and then the last slide is just simply for questions. And then of course I would love for uh, my colleague Dina to share her thoughts. Thank you for, um, you know, for contending with this keynote. Again, I know it wasn't, you know, the kind of, you know, peppy type that we all like to end the day on, but I just really, to me, it was more important to leave you with food for thought. These things are just too important. Thank you. Well, Marina Kay, I want to thank you so very much for your contribution today. Um, it was exactly the note I needed to end on um, <clears throat> because it's Monday and every Monday we have to renew our interactivist and uh, to just continue to move forward uh, with the work we do. Um, and I did want to say I today I saw two of those push notices in my Facebook um, that talked about neurodiversity conferences and yet one of them had no neurodiverse people listed in the agenda. And the other individual one um, had a panel, you know, which to me is better than nothing, but not much. Um, but I did want to just ask you a question. Uh, one of the challenges that I've faced as somebody who's reviewed grants uh, for funding considerations is the fact that in many of the proposals, we see that 
if the uh, sample population is looking a, a great deal like what the CDC incidence rates look like, somehow that's acceptable when we know that the CDC rates are very skewed in regard to the early identification of autistic females, um, the early identification of people of color. Um, do you have any insights um, about like what, what we can do if we're a researcher and we wanna go closer to what we know is true in other adult studies where there is no delineation between race, color, gender, as it applies to autism. Yes, Dana, and I think that, thank you for bringing that up. And I, I think that is something that people, um, you know, do struggle with because I, I think we have seen that it, you know, there are, you know, in terms of, you know, recruitment, retention, you know, of, of certain groups there are, it can be more challenging or can be um, different. You know, to and I think that some of this is because, as, as we know, the underdiagnosis and so forth makes people not even um, able to identify themselves. But I think some of it is in nature, the nature of the way a lot of our research is conducted. Um, is, you know, things that are if, if things feel inaccessible, um, then they often might be to people. So I think that already there is kind of a lack of understanding or 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 potentially buy-in. And then I think that really it's about having are there like trusted. Um, you know, non-elected community leaders that one could um, could reach out to, you know, such as, um, you know, people in the community that um, could kind of like in a, snow, a snowball effect. Um, are there non-traditional ways to, you know, involve someone? Because sometimes I know that as much as I care about things, if I look at something, I'm like, oh my gosh, 60 questions? Okay, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, like, um, or is it or are you having to physically go somewhere where there's going to be difficulty with parking and then there's going to be noise and, you know, or things are unclear. So sometimes I think that, I, I think that first in our, when we're sharing our limitations and so forth, I think we need to explicitly state that we, you know, we don't have the diversity that we want. But I think one way that would help is that, be, you know, aside from when we have a study going in it, I think we need to have more partnerships with, you know, with our, um, you know, um, diverse organizations, with our minority serving institutions, our HBCUs and our, you know, HSIs and our AAPSIs and so forth um, to ensure that we're, you know, that maybe some people who are connected with these, you know, populations, that there'll be kind of like a steady flow. Um, and, and I think if we already have some type of a partnership in general, then it will be one that, um, then it won't be as difficult when we have this happening, you know, when studies are being conducted. And I know that's not a blanket solution. It's just one little tiny sure. possible solution, but I did mm -hmm. want to share that. Well, Re Renee had already said wonderful things about your presentation, mm -hmm. but they go on to say, raising the bar for us to recruit increased numbers of gender, race, um, sex minorities, rural versus urban, rather than do it based on a prevalence rate is really important. Uh, providing data from small samples and subgroups within the article so that we can conduct meta-analysis in the future, um, which is limited due to not, oh, sorry, I got another point and it moved everything, um, uh, is limited to not reporting findings of subgroups or small samples. Um, I just wanna bring this up because I know you were in the meeting with me, but you know, um, Marina Kay and I both serve on the IAC, and it was recently suggested that one of the criteria for um, a research article that might be worthy of promoting to HHS is one with a large sample size. Um, but considering that we're not identifying these other minority subpopulations, I immediately ask what's happening to qualitative research in this process. What were your feelings when we were hearing that, Marina Kay? So my feelings were mixed in, in, in some a sense, it's like, you know, obviously I understand wanting, you know, the size because I feel like things can, you know, things are sometimes skewed and it makes me, you know, concerned. At the same time, I, I really kind of like the idea of kind of like doing like more of the, the kind of the micro analyses because I feel like they'll give us the, I, I feel like the, a lot of stuff that people kind of push away as junk data, how much, you know, how much value is there that we're not looking at there? How much are we missing? You know, and and I really would love to see. Um, it's interesting to me because I see certain things that, um, you know, a lot of people have programs where they're you know maybe doing some undergraduate research mentoring or what have you. And I see these interesting, you know, kind of concepts. I'm like, 
you know, with some mentoring and some, you know, some smoothing around and some, some, you know, massaging this, some of these could be really interesting studies that are, you know, it seems like we're, there's a lot of things that we're not um, looking at. Like there's, you know, a lot of research, you know, in HIV research, for example, there's a community agenda that is um, created every two years. And there's huge feedback that's given globally from different um, individuals, um, whether they're with a site or external. And these things are, are kind of tabulated and calculated and they're presented to the networks um, in terms of helping to devise their research agendas. And I don't know of anything that exists like that in the autistic community. Um, and I think there needs to be one. I, you know, I think that um, people are, being reactive in terms of determining what they're going to study. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a place for that, but I think that being proactive would help as well. I think some of the things that, that people are discovering kind of, you know, um, you know, oh, about GI issues or, you know, um, you know, joint issues or this or that are things that anecdotally or about the, the gender diversity rate and, and the, are the things that anecdotally autistic people could have already told them. Obviously we didn't have proof, you know, but um, if we had been listened to, these things could have been explored at a different time. So I, I feel like it could, in a sense there's, it's size, but it's also um, focus. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of the idea of having representation um, be a priority in terms of funding on some of this grant money. How do you feel about those golden handcuffs? I feel, you know, to me, I, I don't think it, I personally do not think it's ethical um, to, I think people's, um, co you know, compensating um, people at, for their time and their effort is key. And I know that some people will think, well, this is not physically invasive. You know, I'm not doing a lumbar puncture or what have you, but I don't think people understand that the, just the challenges of dealing with everyday life, you know, when you are an autistic person. And, and if we're talking about studies that are multi-generational, like we're looking at, you know, the family dynamics of parent and child. Um, I, I don't think that people realize that this is primarily altruistic. Most of this doesn't do anything to really, you know, a lot of these things, these interventions or what have you, don't make many changes in, in our, you know, current lives. Um, we're really paying it forward. And I think that, um, I know there are, there's limitations and there's, there's policies, but I also see how creative people get in ways and they, they you know, with, with this thing and with that thing. <laughs> and um, it seems like no one tries to apply that same innovation to finding a way to, um, you know, bolster and properly um, compensate the voices of the people who this is all for and who, who this exists for in the first place. Yeah, I'm all in favor of offering a gluten-free pizza for those 60 questions, right? <laughs> um, you know, wh whether you're an autistic adult and you're going to freeze part of it or whether you're the parent of neurodiverse kids um, and some non-neurodiverse kids, just getting a pizza for those 60 questions makes it worth it. And it's mm -hmm. not a lot, you know, mm -hmm. it's not a lot. It's the, it's the, but it's a lot of it is the principle that you show that somebody's, a, right. a, you know, you value their perspective enough and you try to tailor it to something that you feel that the community, you know, you know, that you, you feel would be beneficial or useful or helpful. And, you know, and if you find mechanisms to, um, you know, a lot of studies now are saying, if you need to, you need help with a, a staff person, you know, please call and we'll ask somebody to, you know, finish this with you over the phone or via Zoom or offering multiple ways to be involved so that people don't feel like they're self-selected out from the beginning. And then also offering, you know, like in the terminology, so, um, you know, you know, having choices for gender and for, you know, um, chosen name and things of that nature. So that might fit a person's reality so they don't feel invisible when they are, you know, being screened and ho hopefully having staff that represents the population. So multiple ages, you know, different body types and, you know, races and so forth. Those things are all important as well. As, as a researcher, I mentioned in my breakout group with a different kind of biological clock now facing a dissertation at 62, um, two of the screening questions that always make me opt out is capping that age limit, right? So I'm not eligible because I'm too old. Thank you very much. And the other one is, are you a parent or are you a person with a disability? As yes. if you can have both identities. And they, then they come back and say, well, choose one. And it's like, no, that's not appropriate. Your question's not working for me. Yes. Um, what, what do you think about 
those kinds of challenges as we as participants try to take part? I think they're very, very restrictive and limiting. And I, I've found the same thing. I'm thinking, but I am a parent and a person with disability and a this, and a that. What do you mean choose one? Or even with the race and ethnicity, I find that I'm thinking, okay, well, I think it's very important that we capture the amount, you know, particularly, you know, I, I'm in Texas. So, you know, like, you know, Hispanic or Latin A or what have you, but I'm like, are you not, do you not care about anyone else's ethnicity? <laughs> like, you know, like but just this one, like no one else can put, you know, like, so I feel like, you know, so, and then again, the gender choices and, you know, um, or if people are wanting to, you know, it just, there's just, a, I feel that um, a, a lot of times the reasons that people cap off, oh, well, um, we're, we don't have as much data on X amount of the population. Well, no, of course you don't, because all of your studies end at this stage, you know, um, and so that's why you don't have enough. Or, you know, with a number of people that are, be, that are, you know, getting diagnosed later in life, I, I feel like really we're losing a lot of rich data by not, um, you know, by, by only focusing on children or on transition age. I think that we need to look, transition is very variable when it comes to autistic people, you know, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of us who are above 24 that are still very much in transition in, in one way or another. I always say early intervention should happen whenever you get diagnosed, right? <laughs> there's, there's lifelong intervention. Marina Kate, thank you so much for contributing. I'm going to turn it back over to Dawn now for our closing. Thanks again sure. so much. Great to see you, girl. You too. Thank you so much, Marina Kay and Dina. That was an amazing discussion. Marina Kay, your points are truly a call to action, truly a challenge to all of us to, to do more, to do better. Thank you. I am pleased to uh, close out the meeting with, um, of course, an encouragement to give us some feedback on how it went. There's a link on your screen. There's a QR code on the screen that you can take your phone and open up the camera app and scan it, and it'll take you to a, an online survey that just is a few questions to give us some feedback on how this went, what you would like to see differently next time. Um, and uh, I really thank everyone for their participation today. I think the from start to finish, the opening from Alice, the comments from the project officers, the panel presentation on the Autism Transitions Research Project. I found it very interesting that Marina Gay actually closed the meeting with comments on transition. It felt like full circle. Um, all the breakouts, the rapid fire discussions, the research node leaders, the, the team that creates ARP is phenomenal. And I really hope that everyone saw that today and, and got a lot out of this meeting. We very much look forward to seeing you. Our next research day will likely be in August with the, with the Autism Cares meeting. Uh, we hope to see you again there and um, continue advancing with your most excellent efforts. Thank you so much. Have yourself a wonderful, wonderful afternoon.